But the premise of enlightenment, the concept of it, implies that we believe there exists such a realization, such a recognition, such a transformation in consciousness, that that's even possible. And yes, it is possible. That is my premise. That is my experience. That is my conviction. That is my message, that it is possible. Then the second question would be, then what is it? If it is possible to have such a profound shift in consciousness, in identity, then what exactly is that shift made of? What does it do? What is it? What change are we talking about? What type of transformation? What's the result? Why would I want it? And what do I have to let go of in order to get it or get more of it? Because as you'll see, enlightenment, at least in my way of describing and teaching it, is not a black or white kind of thing. Also because enlightenment is not actually an experience. And again, I'll get into these details. I'll get into these descriptions. But for now, see enlightenment as a spectrum spectrum of the evolution of consciousness, the awakening of consciousness, the ascension of consciousness, the expansion of consciousness, the increase in the dense, the density or brightness with which an entity, a beingness, a consciousness knows itself. So an increase gradually for most, with some leaps typically, but overall gradually for most. Enlightenment is a process, or at least an aspect of the science of enlightenment, could be described as a process of familiarizing yourself, of getting acquainted to, of becoming familiar with that which you have heretofore not really paid attention to, that which you have not recognized, that true state, that natural condition of yourself, which you have not been practicing. You've been practicing a lot of other different kinds of focus points and things. and You've had so much awareness and training in how to be human, according to humans. How to be human, according to other humans, right? So, but what if <clears throat> the true purpose of being human transcends the typical training that we receive in what it means to be human? What if there is this incredible, difficult to describe, transformational journey that we are on, that we are meant to be on, perhaps even. A purpose that brought us here, that makes us continue to wake up every day and do what we do and be driven to do what we do, be motivated to do what we do. What if underneath all that there is sort of a blueprint intention, a baseline purpose that every being potentially, perhaps, shares as their foundational intention or blueprint for being, for appearing, for manifesting themselves in the form of this mind-body-spirit complex or individuated spark of the Creator or individuated spark of God or individuated spark of that universal consciousness, right? The mind-body-spirit complex. Why? Why are we here? And what is possible for us and where did we develop the term or concept of being a human being? Who gave that to us? Did we originally produce that thought, that association, that concept of what it means to be a human being? And even the assumption, the belief that we are a human being and what that is limited to for most people in their understanding. When we say, I am a human being, what are we really saying? that I am, that we are. And typically you will find it doesn't go far beyond that. That means that we are a body. We are a clump of flesh that goes around this planet having to abide by Newton's laws and um, randomly kind of goes about its job or whereabouts. And it picks up desires along the way it prefers pleasure over pain. And so it sets out on this journey to create a life for itself where pleasure is prioritized and pain is attempted to be avoided as much as possible. And we try to secure around this physical body, this physical vehicle that we believe is us. We then attempt to secure for ourselves a series of ongoing circumstances that provide us with safety, physical safety, 
mental emotional safety, self worth safety, and social safety. And we then continue to live in that situational type of consciousness of being a body surrounding itself with what it then calls my life, filled with components and elements that it has a relationship to with its mind, with its thoughts, definitions and concepts that it has about ideas that it has and beliefs that it has about what it perceives, the objects that it gathers about itself. And then it continues in this sort of assumption, in this bubble of being human, and it continues to try to proliferate that bubble of safety and comfort to expand that perhaps a little bit. Some people are more driven to expand that. They seem a little bit more adventurous. They take more risk. Others seem more conservative with their bubble. They are happy with it as it is, content with it as it is, and they'd rather keep it as it is rather than um, expand and take risks on it. Safety is uh, important to them from the point of view of being the body. And there's a, a lot of other ways in which we could summarize what it means to be human, but I'm just trying to paint a general picture of what we assume it is to be human and that we create this bubble around our mind, body, spirit complex or our entity-ness, our beingness, our perceived self or our assumed sense of self. And we don't really look far beyond that bubble, typically, most people. But every once in a while, there is an entity who is either born with or somehow during its lifetime is catalyzed or inspired into seeking beyond this bubble, similar to the story of the Buddha, who pretty much had everything a human being, identified as the body, could ever want. You know, being a prince surrounded with fortunes and blessings and safety and security and everything a man could hope for, so to speak. And yet, being exposed, or at least so the story goes, being exposed to beggars and people living in the streets and old people and death, questions started to appear to this entity that urged it to ask as to the boundaries of its bubble, the validity of its bubble, and what the truth is beyond that bubble. And seeing that suffering firsthand outside of its own bubble, or at the fringes of its own bubble, the edges of its own bubble, it became inspired to seek for a solution for the suffering, an answer to the suffering. And so in a similar way, every once in a while there is a being, and there's more and more of us these days, that are really inspired to look beyond the conventional ideas, and that are born with or inspired with a sense that everything is possible, or at least that the solution to the suffering, that the truth, if you will, whatever that might be, the truth, the experiential inner truth, the truth of existence itself, can somehow be accessed, can somehow be realized by this mind-body-spirit complex. And therefore it is inspired because it believes it is possible. You see, it's very important to believe that enlightenment, and again, think of enlightenment as a spectrum or a gradient, a sliding scale. Don't think of it as black and white. It's not helpful for most people at most stages of this journey. So think of it as a spectrum, as a sliding scale, as a gradient. But it is important that we believe enlightenment or greater enlightenment, more and more enlightenment to be possible. If we don't believe it is possible, then how would we be inspired? How would we be inspired to use our attention in such a way as to maximize the probabilities of our increasing realization of the true self. So first of all, we have to believe that it exists. And I assume that to some degree, at least, you believe there is such a thing as enlightenment or this transformational awakening of what you really are to itself in a very deep, direct, experiential way. I assume that you to some degree believe that that is a possibility, that that exists, sorry, that it exists even. Then second of all, like I was saying, it is important that we believe that it is possible for us to actually directly experience this freedom, this truth, this liberation, this clarity, this transcendent state of self-realization or self-awareness. 
and it is very, very, very possible for every single individual hearing this today. And what a better time to explore this than now, when your external reality seemingly is forcing you to go within, to sequester yourself, to turn your attention to what is truly important for you, to take attention away from the externalities, the external situational experience of your day-to-day -day life, the bubble of your assumptions made manifest. What better opportunity now that we are quarantined, which is just another word for joyfully in retreat with ourselves all around the world, and focus our intention, our efforts, our attention onto topics like these, onto ourselves in a true way, in a way that perhaps some of you have never done before or even considered before. And so again, I'm very excited to be able to deliver this message to you today and to share in this type of exploration at a time like this. It is quite exciting. And uh, once again, thank you for being here. I encourage you to stick with this online retreat, even as things don't quite make sense yet to your intellect, because what you will find with material like this is that the most important aspect of it is the direct introduction to what's being spoken about. It's not so much about developing a conceptual framework or an intellectual understanding of what is spoken about here. It is about this direct introduction to this message. And so the more that you're introduced to it in your own direct experience, because I'm just using my body to produce words for your body to perceive, to then interpret and give some meaning to, which then helps you guide your attention to a certain spot in your consciousness, to a certain quality in yourself, right? So we're, we're having to deal with these tools, these distortions, these translation mechanisms, my brain, my vocal cords, your ears, your brain. But ultimately, and perhaps this is a bit too soon for some of you, but we'll get to this understanding. Ultimately, what's really going on here is that consciousness is actually speaking to itself through the illusion of these brains and these vocal cords and these lips and these ears and that brain and that interpreter. It really is a monologue of sorts. Um, and you will be able to recognize and realize this underlying unity, this ground of being, which is like the canvas to the painting or the screen onto which the movie is projected or the tablecloth, which is made of this one unison material, yet can be lifted up at different points in that tablecloth to the degree where it forms its own individuated mountain shapes. And these mountain shapes can begin to communicate to each other above the service level, if you will. But the truth of it is that it is speaking to itself, that there is this great unity which binds all appearances, which brings me to one of the definitions of enlightenment or self-realization. And that is the realization of oneness, the realization of unity. Because as we deepen our awareness, and I will begin a guided meditation in a little bit to give you this initial introduction in your own direct experience, which is all that matters. It doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what you hear. It doesn't matter what other people say. It doesn't matter what your mind thinks. What matters is that you develop a way to identify within yourself that possibility of which we have been speaking, to which we are hinting, to which we are pointing. The words are not the truth. They are merely the tools we use to help you guide your attention back onto its source. So why don't we just start right there, right now. Take a deep breath. 